Ja? Dit zou er moeten zijn.
I'm ready. So the light is ready. So now we start. May I just invite the, our panelists to come to the front and join me. A mistake with math. <laughs> How many people are joining? Um, no, you can take it. Okay, thank, thanks. Th thanks, Simon. <laughs> thanks. All right, so super happy to uh, host this session, very special session during Cinema Asia. Uh, we will just uh, have a, I think it will be quite casual, but uh, it will also, we, I, I do have a few questions. Uh, but let me start with uh, a very quick round of uh, self-introduction. Uh, I can start from with myself. So I'm Jia Zhao, as you could see from the projection. Uh, I'm a producer of documentary <coughs> films, mainly I'm Chinese, a Dutch producer. I have a production company here, uh, Mui Film and also Silk Road Film Salon. And for, the, for Cinemasia, I'm the brand new artistic director, so I'm still learning by doing. Uh, <laughs> so welcome. And now I give, like, I think maybe we just do a quick round of, uh, yeah. Uh, me? Okay. Yeah, maybe we just do a self-introduction no? oh, instead okay. of that I introduce all of you. Okay, uh, my name is Meiska Taurisia. I'm from Indonesia. I'm a film producer. I have a film in here. Uh, thank you for the invitation from Cinema Asia. We'll be on closing film. Uh, Vengeance is mine, all others pay cash. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Yi Xuan from Taiwan. I'm a, a film programmer at uh, Women Make Wave Film Festival in Taiwan. And I'm also a selection committee uh, for um, international, Taiwan International Documentary Festival with the focus on <coughs> Southeast Asia cinema and Chinese uh, language cinema, including uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, China in general. Hi, <coughs> my name is Tushar. Uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker, uh, artist and researcher from India. Uh, I've mostly done my work uh, from India itself for the last uh, 10 years of my practice. And I recently moved uh, to Paris for an artist residency where I've been researching my project that I'm working on currently. And uh, yeah, looking forward to this talk. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Bo. Uh, I'm an artist, filmmaker, researcher. And I'm, I grew up in China. I moved here two years ago from the States and doing my PhD in cultural study right now uh, uh, with Yufa. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here and I very I look forward to hear um, everyone's opinion about the topic. And hi, I'm Ann Sikulski, and I'm uh, the chair of Taiwan Studies at Leiden University, the International Institute of Asian Studies. I'm not an artist, I'm a professor. <laughs> so, and uh, in the United States, uh, where I am from, I will be teaching at Denison University. And uh, in the past, I've always taught an East Asian cinema course so I'm very excited to be here um, because I'm always looking for new films. And one type of course I've wanted to teach for years, my subspecialty is, uh, my PhD is in Japanese literature and my subspecialty is gender studies. Um, I've always wanted to teach a course solely on uh, women directors in East Asian film. 
and you know, finding films that are available in English uh, with English subtitles for American students, as well as finding films by uh, women directors in the past has been very difficult. And I'm very pleased to see uh, films in this festival by women directors. So you know, this is a course I would love to teach in the future. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Okay, so. Very heavy-weighted uh, panel, I would say. So why I think this panel, this is the first part of the panel. Actually, the intention behind this rather academic, I would say, slash film, first part is uh, my, uh, I, I have a, I have a uh, dream, or I think it will be uh, part of very important uh, aspect of Cinemasia to provide the possibility for people who like to go deeper into Asia culturally and also from a cinema point of view should have the opportunity to discuss and to listen, to talk about. But it's just not only watching films. I find sometimes where to find the entrance would need to start with uh, something that, that has to do with a cultural background. So I think that the first part of this session is really dedicated for that purpose. Uh, that's why I invited like really people who are from that region who have been doing studies and, and through film but also from an academic point of view just to take us a little bit further down the line uh, so that if you go to see our films you will say ah that country it has that piece of history because Asia of course it's a very undefined region so after saying this this is just to give you a little bit of a context or what, like why this panel is being t and is like this and why we would like to do this in a film festival. And after, after saying this, I would like to move uh, quickly to my first question. I think I will just randomly pick up someone <laughs> <laughs> just to kick off. And I so how do you perceive the positioning of Asia in the world in particular? in the contemporary history of the last 50 to 100 years. I think that <laughs> I, I, I am born in year 70, so when I look back upon what I have, like, I thought eight, year 80 is already kind of, like, it, it has become such a history, no? I thought it's so close, but, but I thought if we look back upon our, let's say, really recent history, a lot already has happened. I thought it's really interesting to just, as Asian, as people who study Asia, just maybe to share some thoughts on this changing landscape as well. So, um, who should I go to? <laughs> <laughs> maybe uh, Maisk. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> or maybe Tusha, <laughs> why not? <laughs> Do you mind? No, um, sure. Uh, it's really interesting because I think this question also is coming at a time uh, to us where uh, we're, we've just been through um, <clears throat> a pandemic. Uh, and I think uh, the, the resonance of a lot of questions and ideas that were for a very long time sort of regionalized uh, suddenly came into picture because of uh, just a very sort of a global experience that we were humanly experiencing. Um, I think it's a little hard for me to like go like 50 years because it would be, I haven't really done that kind of research or study myself. But um, I do think that uh, in my experience of uh, looking at how um, the idea of representation of voices and narratives that sort of also happens on an international platforms, um, um, it's the more I've been witnessing it, I kind of come across this very sort of paradoxical um, aspect of the idea of inclusivity or inclusion uh, that comes into play a lot of times because uh, there is always this fear of uh, the idea of inclusion uh, leading to a certain sense of either fetishization or a certain kind of a categorization and labeling of the very identity that we are trying to sort of represent. Um, and that I find is, is somewhere inherently sort of paradoxically, like it's, it's a bit flawed, but it's also something that I think we kind of like need to pay attention to those questions now more so than ever in a society that we are feeling is increasingly more labeled and you know, we're living in a world of like hashtags and labels for everything that we do. Uh, so to what extent are we uh, aware uh, and cognizant of 
the, the questions of who has the agency of making the inclusion, who is making that inclusion, what is the intention behind those inclusion. And I also feel that there is also the question of what if the agency of inclusion were to be given in the hands of the people for whom the change is intended? And then let's see if there is any kind of a change in the nature of the curation or the programming or the creation itself in the way that we are um, uh, looking at our own sort of selves uh, and our own reflection of how we are represented in an international scale. So I think these questions are definitely a lot more important and pronounced today. And uh, yeah. 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 This person, uh, <laughs> I, I probably can answer this. Um, um, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll answer this in a very personal way. Uh, the whole reason uh, my PhD is in Japanese literature. So my PhD is in Japanese literature, and the whole reason I'm even an Asia scholar goes all the way back to my grandfather, who was born in the late 1800s. Uh, he was a journalist in Shanghai uh, from 1917 to 1931, and he was immersed in, in, in the, what was going on in China at the time. He worked for Sun Yat-sen in Chiang Kai-shek, um, and so this is one of the roads to my connection to Taiwan. Um, uh, when he married, he married a, a woman who was Chinese. She was friends with a, a Sung Mei Ling, Madam Chang, and their marriage was an interracial marriage at a time when things like this were not okay. When they returned to the United States in 1931 with my uncle, who was half Chinese and half Jewish, two, two things that were not okay in the United <laughs> States back then. Um, <laughs> Uh, his wife was not allowed in the country. They had the anti-Asian um, immigration laws at that time, and their marriage was not recognized, and therefore she was not allowed in the country. And so it took um, a year, uh, and she had, her story is fascinating, but she had a British passport, and so she traveled through Canada and entered the United States via New York where the racism towards Asians was not as pronounced. Um, and so I grew up with that story. The other things I grew up with in, in our very small apartment in New York City was the art that my grandfather brought back from his life in China. And so I, I was raised in New York City in the 70s, um, and on our walls were these uh, beautiful paintings and the, you know silk scrolls with Chinese characters in them, and just the story of my grandfather's uh, very adventurous life. Uh, when he returned to the United States in 1931, he became a very famous journalist. Uh, he was one of the China hands, meaning he was one of the few people in America at the time who really had deep insider knowledge into Chinese culture. and, it, and um, the U.S. government was very interested in what he had to say. So that, that's his story, and I mean, that's going way back, but it just goes to show you that in, in the 1930s, the average American knew very little about Asia. Then, then uh, when it's my turn and I go to college, uh, this is now the 80s, and the country that was on everyone's radar was Japan. And so um, it's a long story how I ended up in Japan, but, but I ended up in Japan uh, living and working, and then I traveled to China to see the world that my grandfather had lived in. By the time I went to China, China was very different. It was, uh, my first trip to China was in 1990. It was a year after Tiananmen Square. And there was this huge disconnect for me between the beautiful art we had in our apartment mm -hmm. and the, the 1990 China that I was experiencing. Um, when I went to Japan, I went to Japan right after Ezra Vogel wrote Japan is Number One, and I was um, in the, the countryside of Japan. And again, I was seeing a real disconnect between what I was reading um, and what I was experiencing in Japan. 
then eventually I, I go to graduate school and I studied Japanese literature because you know I picked up Japanese and, and liked living in Japan. Um, and I became very interested in women's issues um, as a result of having been a Peace Corps volunteer in the 80s in Morocco. And that's yet another story about cross-cultural um, observations and Orientalism and all, all of that. So um, when, I, when I was in graduate school, the training was very formal. It was, you will master the canon of Japanese literature. Um, you, the, there are certain writers I needed to know. Um, and uh, it, it was very strict, very conservative. Over the years, and this brings me to why I'm here on this panel and why I'm a chair of Taiwan Studies at Leiden University. Over the years in, in my work, um, even as I was leaving graduate school, um, it, it took about nine years to get through grad school, um, uh, the, the boundary of what constituted Japanese national literature was starting to open up because you had a new generation of students being mentored by a, a less conservative uh, generation of professors. So the, the issue, of course, of Japanese literature is colonial literature. Mm -hmm. What do you do with all the literature that was written in Japanese by non-Japanese people? Mm -hmm. Um, so the Zainichi, the resident Koreans, uh, what do you do with the literature of Taiwan that was written in Japanese? Um, and so when I was finishing my dissertation in Tokyo, uh, the, my, book, my dissertation in my uh, first book is on this writer, Tamara Toshiko. She had lived in, uh, uh, she ended up living in California and then she lived in Japanese-occupied Shanghai. So I, I, because of her life experience, I started studying a lot about colonialism and post-colonialism. And um, through that, I met a, a colleague, a, grad, a graduate student at the time, who is now my uh, friend and dear colleague, Pei Chen Wu, who is in Taiwan at National Chengchi University. And she and I were both writing our dissertations on the same writer but Pei was doing it in Chinese and I was doing it in English. Mm -hmm. And um, so after we graduated and got our jobs and were like enthusiastic, freshly minted professors with you know, a lot of optimism, we met um, and she invited me to Taiwan because she wanted me to look at an archive of a colonial Taiwanese journal mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, written in Japanese, backed by Japanese money, um, but it was for the women of Taiwan. So it, in Japanese, Taiwan Fujinkai, so the world of Taiwan women. And, I, and that word Taiwan, I think, is very ambiguous. Uh, like, what do we mean when we say Taiwan women? Um, this, the journal was published from 1934 to 1939. So, so that's the research that I'm doing at Leiden University, um, is really examining this colonial journal, this byproduct of Japan's uh, empire, Japan's uh, rule in Taiwan. And I think discussions of imperialism that ignored Japan, where it's only, one only talks about the British or the French, really ignores a very, Japan creates a very interesting, um, complex uh, thread to any discussion of imperialism because Japan was um, uh, colonizing areas where the people being colonized were from the same heritage, mm. which was very different from British colonialism and French colonialism. And, um, and so I'm always troubled when one talks about imperialism and does not include Japan in that. Japan was imitating the European colonizers but it was colonizing people who were of the same heritage and, and looked the same. Um, so, uh, so anyhow, th that's a long answer. Very interesting. I think this, is, this brought also this, this word, I think, imperialism. That, of course, is a word that Asia, when we talk about Asia, but it's very good that you bring this 
like in the, like because I think most time we if we think it's more like the West colonized the East, right. but of course it's much broader in that sense. Uh, really, if we go back, but I would like now to, to switch the topic a little bit, just to go straight to like one boy. For instance, you are born after me. <laughs> I, I happen to know in year eighty, which I think it's a year. It's a period of time when China, of course, I guess. And you also, I left China early 90s, so basically I have been watching China a little bit more from outside, but of course you uh, have been experiencing that uh, from inside out. Um, the rise of China, so to speak, I guess from the East Asia point of view, that of course is, has been following Japan's economic rise to become some kind of economic power of the world, and it's just some, somehow about India as well, but I guess I just wanted to hear your point of what, what has changed in mm. from like uh, after your birth. <laughs> well, I think um, mm, I think it's actually kind of reverse experience because uh, I was born in the uh, beginning of eighties, and um, I think eighties I still have the memory, but it's not very clear. And um, when I was in my teenage hood uh, in the nineties, I think um, this feeling that the country is like you know in a constant change, everything changing so quick. Every three years, the whole city, everything is different. I think, um, you know, growing, growing up in that time, I really internalized that kind of, um, this kind of speed of change as, as given. I never questioned this is a special period of time since it's happening very fast. I think that's how things should always be. And um, after I moved to the States around like 2007, and uh, then there was this kind of moment of revelation, realized actually, Back back then in the nineties, everything was very. It's a particular moment, and um, you know, when I was, I think when I was, um, I actually also moved to New York um, back then. Um, yeah, looking at people, I don't know, like like one time I see people who looks like from the movies from eighties or seventies, that kind of feeling. I think when you were in China in the nineties, you don't have that feeling. You don't feel like the history might continue. You you have the feeling that things are keep unfolding and changing, re evolving, but nothing will stay. I think that's something I took as granted, but later on, after, le after I left China and also um, start looking back, I feel actually, um, you know, that's how things should not, uh, things are not always like that, yeah. And uh, this type of like big changes in our recent history, I now would like to go to more uh, like a really direct uh, of, well, curator, but also as a producer, I think from Asia and based in Asia as well. I just would like to see how this kind of changes of the last 50 or maybe, you know, a little bit longer, don't have to go all the way back, but it's like how in your uh, perception has been or are still being reflected in Asian filmmaking. I can just share a bit my work experience as a film programmer. Um, maybe just from, from, because I relocated in Amsterdam um, in 2019, just right before the pandemic. So I think I can just share this in the past two years, you know, because, you know, the pandemic hit everyone's life a lot. And we know all the events and film festival were postponed, canceled, a major film festival uh, moved their program online. And I think um, in terms of the situation in Taiwan, uh, we are quite fortunate because I think our government, they um, took action quite well. We, we didn't have a total lockdown. Uh, we still have our uh, cinema opened and our film festival still took place in a physical way in the past two years. So I still could, you know, people still could go to the film festival. Of course, you need to wear a mask and keep social distance, but at least, you know, film festival still happened and I still could do my job as a film programmer. I still could um, program in film with my team in Taiwan, remotely, of course, because I relocated in Amsterdam. So um, I think despite the, you know, the, the, in the past two years, the pandemic hit us a lot. I mean, for like all, everybody, of course. Um, and the film industry do um, affect it a lot. Um, but we still, I, I still see this kind of opportunity for us to rethink and reflect 
um, the, the uh, alternative way of presenting film and alternative way of um, programming film. And I see that because, um, for example, in Taiwan, like Golden Horse Film Festival, they develop um, online platform in the past two years because, um, of course, we, we the, the cinema is still going on, but we need to you know, keep social distance, to, so have a very limited capacity. So the fe festival start to think about a hybrid way to you know, reach out more audience as much as possible. So um, Golden Horse uh, Film Festival, they start their online platform to introduce um, Chinese uh, language cinema to the world, and which is, is I think that is also the opportunity for Asian cinema as well, because before that, if for example, if we want to see the Asian cinema like in the Netherlands, um, either you, that film need a big name or, or won a big award in festival. And otherwise, or, or you need a local distributor for the, you know, for the release, and it's quite difficult for Asian cinema. But I think f through you know online streaming platform, we can watch those content at home, and it's much more accessible for people. But of course, I, I think there are a lot of still a lot of problem and challenging behind this. And I think I just wanted to respond to this, but also in a way to challenge your question. It is really about the platform that is not there. It is about some kind of colon colonialism or imperialism that is still going on of some kind because, well, this is just really a daring question. I'm not, there's no answer to that, but I also would like to, actually, we are talking about our experience. It's not, there's no judgment. Yeah, and, and I think things are changing. Just wanted to see where we are and how things are changing. Maybe how can we make the change if we think that something perhaps should be changed? I would like to definitely now go to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'm from Indonesia, so I think if we want to see the changes in Indonesia, it's uh, if we go back like 100 years ago, it's a, uh, definitely about colonialism because I mean like, many Europeans came to Indonesia for the spices from the British, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, and of course Dutch is the longest, like 350 years, starting as a trader, but then la later become another thing. And also Japan uh, was in Indonesia too. So I think like we, we have that time so if we talk about changes, I think like the very significant one is like, you know, the changing between like this when we have the independence for Indonesia. But I think after that, I mean, uh, as we are independent from other countries, I think there are things that I also experience personally, like very different. I'm Chinese Indonesian, but I don't speak Chinese. So, uh, but I mean, like the way even we describe ourselves, like Chinese Indonesian, like sometimes you don't do that. You know, I remember I was like, I, I went to China, to Shanghai at, at that time, and I was like just on the street and then looking for something, and then I asked people there, uh, and then their response will be, oh, so you're not Chinese. I was like, I mean, in Indonesia, they will call me Chinese, you know, and in, but in China, they don't call me Chinese. So, I mean, like those kind of things that, uh, for me, it's, it feels uh, a lot as an Indonesian because I go through a period where the, during the dictatorship era with Suharto, where um, I have my uncle who lives in, in here because he doesn't want to change his name and his identity and you have to leave the country at that time. Um, I remember when it was in the 80s when we have an election, for example, political election, I remember my mom will ask us, like, like she was driving us to school, for example, in the morning, but then uh, later there is this campaigners, and then she will ask me, like, okay, everybody, like, just to go down so they won't see us, like, a car with all these Chinese, uh, um, you know, um, yeah, it's with Chinese. So I think, I, I mean, I remember very uh, clearly that that kind of changes in Indonesia and I also, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I went to a Catholic school, uh, 
and I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you like the next shifting in Indonesia with the how now, I mean, probably everyone can read like how the religion fundamentalism in Indonesia. So I remember I was studying, uh, when I was in uh, junior high school and high school, I went to a girl's Catholic school where our skirt has to be 10 centimeter below, my, below the knee, you know? And I really remember I went uh, from the school to home by bus and I look all the girls in the public school, they were like using me very, like the skirt, they are very, you know, like half of the thigh at that time. And this is in the 80s. And if I see now, everyone is wearing hijab. You know, I really, really remember taking a bus, like they were like, the girls just like wearing this height of skirt. And now the other way around, I mean, we are still in this line of the skirt, but they are now in here, you know. So I think like those kind of changes for me is, is really obvious. I mean, in the 80s, in the 90s, and now. And I would say in terms of like film, I mean, this is the changes that I feel as a filmmaker, because now you get to be able to talk about this. Mm. You get to be able to say something about it and to voice uh, about these changes in the film. Uh, do you think that uh, the world is ready to uh, go like to 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 listen to these kind of stories. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, from but I also would like to go to you, and I think maybe also the filmmaker side, and just because I feel sometimes uh, as we call this panel, it's place Asia on the world map. Of course, it feels it it, it says big, but what I I think what 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 is me meant to say is that sometimes you feel a bit showcased. Uh, and, and instead of like you are showing something. So I just would like to kind of, uh, because there are so many stories and about changing landscape, I just wanted to see from a filmmaking point of view, from people who are working as producer, as a filmmaker, how you perceive, but also as curate, do you see a chance to curate your film, to show it to the world? Is the world like uh, ready or willing to kind of? Uh, yeah, uh, I would say yes. Um, at least in, the, in Indonesia, with Indonesian films, uh, we are potentially a lot of big, bo big box office in Indonesia. I mean, a lot. Our population is a lot. So, if we have like a, a box office, we didn't. We, do, we don't count by the revenue. We count by the admission. For example, the biggest box office in Indonesia will be seven million audience. I probably like. China will be bigger, of course. But I mean, like within this Southeast Asia region, uh, we are quite the biggest. And going back to your question, I think uh, diversity in country like Indonesia is something that, you know, I mean, when they make film, of course, if we talk about film, there are different kind of films. But I do believe the one that, you know, talks about and being inclusive, like with diversity, I still believe that this is the voice that they want to say. I mean, Indonesia in the making, like with independence, we're not make, I mean, like this country is not built because we, we know that we are one ethnicity. We didn't, we don't go through that, you know, process of like, because we have the same identity, then we make this country. No, instead, because we have the same enemy, then we make this country. So from that perspective, the diversity is already there from the very beginning. But the question, the challenge is still also a lot because when the, the enemies are gone, you know, like leave us with all with diverse thing and then there then the, you know, the, the, the challenge like the, the friction between this and that's where it goes now, the direction of Indonesia. But I think in terms of voice, I do believe uh, when you're making film, I mean, like so many things, like so many difficulties, so many capital and resources to make film. I do believe like uh, there are so many voices, like these small, small voices that, you know, from Indonesia, for example, that it is something that is not heard. Mm. You know, I think there are so many things that, that this very small, it sometimes it's not heard and I think the, the the good thing, like the best thing with film festival is is, is this is the, the, the place to to get our voice, you know, like for example, in in your program you have Myanmar diaries. I mean we know what's going on now there. I mean like we have a I have a friend who wants to shoot that but then cannot shoot anymore, you know. Like I think 
uh, this is the, the, the place and the space to, to have this kind of discussion, like as a window to really understand what is going on with our neighbors. Mm. Yeah, so, but I will just go like this, I think, because you all represent different kind of aspects. Yeah, I think that is very crucial question, very yeah, very important. But it's quite difficult to answer it in a simple way. But I, I think, as a programmer uh, who worked with film festival back in Asia in Taiwan, would would have different point of view from film programmer work in European film festival, and I think, um, yeah, it's. It's always like for, 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 from my perspective, I think what we do is try to open up more space for Asian young talent and try to keep a space for them. Because, you know, of course I also encourage young talent, young Asian talent go to uh, main stage of European film festival, but I, I don't want them feel that if their film didn't select it by Western Film Festival, that means they are not qualified as a filmmaker. So from my, from my own position, I think what I can do is I want those young Asian talents can go on their profession, go on their career. So yeah, th that is my take. So Asia should do something for Asian. No. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, not only like that, I mean, I mean, um, yeah. You, Lin you can be can, <laughs> so we do our own can, or, no? um, <laughs> or you think something Yeah, or, or maybe, maybe film festival that um, focus on Asian cinema should, um, you know, like collaborate more. Ah, and that's work, a good yeah, point. Yeah, and work <laughs> as a collective, because that could make the platform more wider. Yeah, I, I think that is a very important point that you touch upon. And, and Tusha, I happen to know that you made a film also about Kashmir, a very controversial place. So, but I, but I, I would like to maybe just to answer my previous question, but in that context. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, it's it's quite interesting to think to ask this question, uh, and um, you know. The idea of also, I think, uh, the na a national identity is, uh, as a filmmaker, I came across quite strongly for the first time when I was in Kashmir. And to be honest, like, I never thought of myself as an Indian uh, until I was in Kashmir. And over there, I uh, was looked at as an Indian filmmaker with a camera who must have an agenda because I'm in Kashmir. And that is because that's how normally how the narratives work. Um, but in that context, it was also very interesting for me to kind of encounter a landscape, a, a cultural landscape in Kashmir. Um, and I was making this film uh, back in 2013. I started in 2013 and finished around 2016. Um, and during this time uh, was really the surge of the internet uh, in Kashmir as a region um, which had witnessed a long blockade of information just not going out, or whatever information uh, or the narratives that go out, they're manufactured uh, by the mainstream media. And I wasn't quite aware of also the kind of polarization uh, that really exists uh, within these sort of narratives and one sort of has to encounter. So I actually came across uh, a lot of young artists, hip hoppers, contemporary artists, uh, musicians, uh, poets, uh, who realized that in the 90s they had actually witnessed an entire loss of an entire generation uh, from the Kashmiri uh, uh, people. And the youth sort of realized the importance of using art and the internet as a medium to express the dissent and resistance, uh, with the help of which they were actually able to tr uh, track a lot of international attention, um, and I sort of happened to be in that flux of that time when I was in Kashmir. Um, and of course, like being an Indian, like, and that sort of understanding of the fact that you're Indian, and of course, you're also hated as an Indian. All you read everywhere is, you know, Indian dogs go back. But also kind of my own understanding of Kashmir um, was uh, unfolding in, a, in an experience that was rather... Um, 
it was this process of letting go of a certain kind of conditioning. Uh, because when I reached Kashmir, um, I did not have particular uh, reverence towards the ins institution of the army anyway, but uh, to be in Kashmir where you're constantly surrounded by an overbearing presence of the military in the city, in your vicinity, constantly looking at you, even though it is the Indian army, uh, was really overwhelming for me. Um, I felt rather uh, intruded, uh, fearful at, at different points of time. And uh, the, this idea of the identity itself started really speaking out to me very loudly at that point of time because I hadn't even thought of myself, like I said, as an Indian until then. Um, I think these, uh, uh, of course, the space of the internet and, and the alternate, I think we were talking about, uh, one of us mentioned the word alternate and a word alternate, and I think that it's, it was really interesting for me to find that domain in Kashmir. Uh, as a space where they were looking for al alternate forms of uh, putting the stories out to be heard. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course the internet played a huge amount of uh, uh, role in that and contribution in that. But again, from the point of the colonialism in India, and I think it's important that I also bring the fact that we're living in a time where post-colonialism in India is so uh, entrenched and so strong. Uh, that we are actually witnessing, I mean, the Indian polity uh, colonializing, uh, colonizing Kashmir, colonizing their own uh, indigenous communities. There are over 700 indigenous communities in India. Most of them are forest dwelling. And since the 1980s, India has witnessed an active uh, act of trying to fold in the indigenous into the national imagination of the country through the medium of arts. We are the artists bringing the artists into the ethnographic, these national ethnographic and anthropological museums of the country as a way to again include uh, the artists, include the voices, but at the same time leading to a certain kind of this post-colonial fetish uh, to maintain that sort of hegemony, to subsume uh, them within a certain kind of an urban fetish of what one sort of believes to be the indigenous identity as. And I think that I also kind of witnessed in Kashmir in a completely different way, wherein when you are sort of ra been raised and brought up in mainland India where the idea of Kashmir is heavily fetishized, is this paradise and this beautiful valley, which is of course Indian, it is ours. And you kind of reach there and you realize that no, but the sentiment is completely different. The, the feeling is completely different you feel differently. Um, and I think uh, we're, I mean, I, am, I hope so. I really hope so, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, just return, I'm just arriving here from a film festival um, where they had an, an, a Pan-African theme going on. It's a European film festival and it was interesting programming, uh, but it was surprising for me to realize that if you have a Pan-African theme going on in the film festival, how many African curators do you have in your programming team? <laughs> And I think these are the larger, bigger questions that we are now beginning to raise. And I'm glad that the festival is open to these kind of critiques and questions. Um, but again, I kind of witnessed the same, the, this question of what you asked, whether are, are we being showcased or are we showing, are we sharing the stories that we're telling or are we, are we telling what we're sort of supposed to tell? Are we sort of fitting a certain kind of like a box uh, in some way, and I think, I hope we are able to find that navigation because I think as a film practitioner, I also struggle with it. Um, given that, you know, there are literally no fund, there is no funding for the documentary films in India and I have to look out. I'm looking out for international fundings and then uh, sort of navigating the same structures that I'm somewhere also critiquing. So I think it's, it's a tough journey, uh, but I'm glad the questions are being raised and I hope like we kind of like find that navigation somewhere. Yeah, I think it's always very really good to be aware of that first of all and then we discuss about and and be aware like as also earlier said this uh, how Asian platforms could possibly also collectively work together. I think that is definitely, and also what you and more people are pointing out, of course we are living in a streaming streamer leading age of some of, of some kind and but i would like to also to move on thanks so much for to also 
both, I think, you as uh, a more academic filmmaker, I would go arti artist, of course, <laughs> and I, coming from China, going to New York, and then coming to U Europe. Um, how is your thing, like, like my earlier question, but I just wanted mm. to do this round, and then I will think, I think I will have to slowly finish our first part yeah. to give it to the next part, which will be how to do films together if we need funding, and if we need producers, and if we need, yeah, no, so. Yeah, I, I would like to first pick up from what uh, Ruby said earlier. I was feel like um, uh, in terms of this kind of pan-Asian kind of collaboration between different kind of platforms, and also festivals, institutions from different region. I was thinking about this idea that how, when we're talking about the notion of Asian, Asian is, you know, like we talk about what is at stake about being Asian or Asian filmmaker, Asian films. And there's always a logic behind that, you know, we are struggling with the, first of all, the representation, second of all, the positionality of where Asian belong to, you know, like what, what kind of uh, reference or point do we compare to? Um, in a way, we, I mean, in a bigger history, I think we all experience this kind of transition, you know, in many parts of Asia, of course, different regions have different kind of cultural context, but we more or less all go, went through certain kind of colonization period and of decolonization in being independent. But also we have seen, you know, particularly in the past 50 years, there's like the rise of nationalism, like the border really become a thing in Asia. I think this is something contextually very different from the experience living in Europe, because nowadays in Europe, you don't really feel the border. You, you travel, just you, you buy a train ticket, uh, you go to Brussels and you come back the same day. And then you don't have um, embodied experience of how, what border really means. But if you really live in Asia, you understand border is such a rigid thing that's in sometimes almost insurmountable in many ways. And I think, um, you know, uh, first of all, that makes the, um, the, the context of Asian, culturally speaking, very different from Europe. But at the same time, I think, um, you know, film festivals and cultural venues, art institutions, and also it's this, this kind of bridge, I think, really, uh, interestingly, help people to bypass the borders. Mm -hmm. So collaboration can happen, we can, we can start to have more experience with each other and understand what, what are the experience of people who live on, uh, on the other side of the border. And, but then, at the same time, I think the interesting thing is also film festival has also a history of how it's very Eurocentric. And also when the, um, you know, look in the history of, for instance, Venice, Berlin, in the early days, it's really constructed on the idea of a national cinema. So from the beginning, like it's really kind of defined those, this movie production, this kind of uh, cultural production in boxes of, of nation states. How can we possibly bypass that? I think that's some, some kind of question. And I also would like to uh, hear other people how they, they think. I think we will address those questions also very substantially in the second part, where we will talk, of course, about how to do film production and in a, in a, in an age as now, you know, to to kind of address these kind of points. Uh, I, I I think uh, like culture is probably less regional than the border, the uh, and I think that is really a very interesting remark, just to think that way culturally how we could bind each other. And uh, I would like to come to you, Anna, and because, of course, you are the <laughs> expert of <laughs> anthropology, you are the <laughs> only person of this panel which is <laughs> not that much with film, but I, but I think I think when I talked with your colleague uh, earlier that uh, there was a word dropped, the oral history, and that in the academic context is also very important. I think our history books are all written, you know, well, not all, I may not say all, but sometimes are written to serve certain purposes. Right. But I guess it's just like, like film or culture can bypass certain kinds of border, maybe, you know, film yeah. could become a very important part of anthropological study as well. Yeah, so uh, so I can speak more from my perspective as an educator and the and the, the use of film in the classroom. So again, you know, when I was in graduate school, it was literature. Here are the male authors you will read and master and understand the literary movements and the history behind the works. Um, a, a theme in all my classes that I teach is the power of the narrative. And so in the course of the 
20 some odd years of being a professor, um, my, my sort of definition of a story and literature has very much expanded. So when I was in grad school, um, film studies was barely on the map. Um, I'm now, you know, I teach at small liberal arts colleges in the middle of the United States. I'm smack in the Midwest. And film studies programs are, are very popular. Um, and uh, so, so when you're seeing the growth of film studies programs in colleges across the United States, and I'm sure the same is true elsewhere. Um, but then also the way I teach and what I consider a work to study. So for example, a few years ago, my colleagues and I, I, I was at a different institution and I was in a comp lit department. We did an exhibit, a pop-up art exhibit. Uh, we took over a closet that no one cared for and we turned it into a pop-up art space. And we had a, an exhibit called Textiles. So we were playing on the idea of text in mm. textiles. And, um, uh, and actually a project that I'm probably going to get involved in at uh, the Institute uh, in Leiden is on humanities across borders. And it's a project mm. where we're going to look at the stories that are wo literally and figuratively woven into textiles and, you know, you know, who's behind making mm. this material, why, and so on. And, and getting to some of the points uh, raised here on this panel, when I, when I teach anything, literature or film, um, I have my students really think about why it is that they are able to read an English translation mm. or to watch a film with subtitles, why they can do so in the middle of Ohio <laughs> in, in the 21st century. And so I really, make them think about the economics and the politics uh, behind why they get to hear this story. So the power of the narrative, there's a million stories out there in so many different ways, and but we only hear some of them. And you know, there are political, uh, socioeconomic reasons for this. So that's really become the, the, the sort of motivation and thread in every course I teach. And I, I chuckled uh, about the issue of fetishization. You know, often professors of uh, anything in Asia will have on their plate a survey course, right? You know, the, the East Asian film, which I've taught. I, I've taught, of course, East Asian film. And how do you teach? You know, first place, what do you mean by East Asia? And what of the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of films, which ones do I select to cover yeah. all of East Asia when my colleagues in other departments, you know, get to teach, uh, you know, a very specific time period, like the, the British novel of the 18th <laughs> century, whereas I used to teach a survey course, East Asian literature, mm -hmm. right? In 15 weeks, I had to teach all of East Asian literature, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so interesting. I think so many interesting uh, points are raised, and really, I think we can go on for really <laughs> another few hours because I also uh, have been really inspired by what has been talked about. So I think it's now time to wrap. Uh, and of course, I guess after this, we could continue this conversation elsewhere. But I would like to wrap with a few keywords. At least I kind of could memorize. Uh, I hear people say, I hear here say that uh, Asian uh, platforms of very kind should collectively work together. I find that is really something uh, uh, important to, for me at least, uh, to also to hear say. And at the same time, I also find it's uh, like, uh, I think we have been experiencing interesting time, I, an interesting between brackets in a way that a lot of separation uh, just because also the COVID could did, uh, keep us at our place and there are a lot of polari polarized frustration. And I feel what Bo, you pointed out, but also Tusha, you were saying like when you go to some place and actually you, you, you were confronted, but by this confronting, somehow you realize where you are. And also this 
seems to be a power that could bypass some kind of borderline that is geographically put down there. And I feel that film also for an anthropological study and for study of very kind, it's not only from the textbook, it could be so important to shape our mind. And I think that's where why we are here as a festival. And it's not to say that we are the best or we are, but it's just really as we say often to embrace our differences. I think how to embrace that is first to feel from each other and to kind of to be shocked at sometimes, but also to 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 cherish once you come once you see that ah this is different, but it is that's why it's so beautiful. So thanks so much for uh, being with us, and I think with this, I just would like to thank our panelists, and uh, yeah, so see you at the uh, uh, next one. Let's go, I, we take a 10 minutes break, or something like that, I guess. Oops. <laughs> oh, who did it? <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, look who's speaking. <laughs> okay, it's, it's more stable. <laughs> uh, we start now and just uh, slowly, and uh, I will do the same thing. Uh, just ask panel uh, to briefly introduce themselves. I think it's the same audience. Or more or less, so I will skip my own self-introduction because I just did for the first part. Uh, yeah. yeah, you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you you use that one. Yeah, so so I start one. from here. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's Liu Xuan. I come from China. I'm producer. Nice to meet you here. Uh, hello, I, I'm Meska Taurisia from Indonesia. I'm film producer too. Nice to meet you here. <laughs> My name is Dan. I work for a company called Cinema Delicatessa. It says there. And we're a distributor of um, documentary films in cinemas. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Eric. I'm a producer at the Dutch production company with sister companies in Belgium and Germany called Lemming Film. And my name is Corinne van Egeraad. I'm a filmmaker and producer based here in the Netherlands. Uh, my production company is Zindok, and I'm the producer of the film Myanmar Diaries that's here at the festival. Hi, my name is Lona T. I'm Malaysian, uh, living here in Amsterdam. I'm a film producer, film programmer, uh, curator, and also all-round uh, film lover. <laughs> Maybe just to add, uh, Liu Xuan is a producer of uh, Wang Xiaoshuai, and he, she and they are both here actually also uh, in collab. To, to it's because of the collaboration with Lemming Film. So I guess just to put this in the in the context that you are here for the new film, and Eric is uh, working for Lemming Film, which is a Dutch counterpart of that particular project as well. So. And also, and Dan is also the, the Dutch distributor for Myanmar Diary. So it's all connected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess uh, this session too uh, is really a bit of a hardcore film context. Uh, and uh, I d because for the text, for the session one, I actually sent out a question list, or like says, this is going to be the question I'm going to, and for this session too, actually, there's no, <laughs> and nobody asked me either. So <laughs> I guess that is perhaps also part of being a producer of some kind, um, and also, <laughs> um, so actually, I think the, 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 I would like to focus uh, with this, just to see how we could uh, collaborate to bring Asian cinema to the world, and maybe uh, and what 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 are already going very well, and what perhaps could go even better. And also, uh, I invited also this group of uh, uh, established uh, professionals uh, to who also have their in their career experience with uh, collaborating between the East and West, just to to, to put it a little bit broadly. So maybe I will start uh, by uh, just uh, by asking your past experience in terms of collaboration, uh, like uh, I, I would say like uh, collaboration on a, an Asian film that is um, realized or let's produced uh, or is screened um, or let's say uh, internationally produced and distributed. Just a few case study, what has been difficult and what has been Rewarding. <laughs> oh, I start with Lorna. <laughs> <laughs> she is <laughing>. So me. <coughs> um, where do you start with a question like that? Um, and and also, you know, I like what a lot of the previous panelists talked about. You know, and also how do you define Asia? People always say, "Oh, are you 
a Malaysian producer? Are you an Asian producer? I say I'm just a producer. I like if I like the story and I I I, I feel I feel that I can work with the filmmaker. Then I want to work on it. I don't you know this borders geography. Uh, you know locations where you're based. It's all. Um, something that is so arbitrary in, in what you choose to do as a producer for me. Um, but of course, when we come to the reality of, you know, making a film, you have to have an address because that address is needed for you to fill up a form. The form is needed for you to get funding. The funding is needed for you to make your film. And then the, the qualifications, the distributors all need that address. Um, so it's something that's always been sort of like hard for me to define because people always say, where are you, where are you based? And I'm like, I don't know. I used to be based on Cathay Pacific, but you know, Hong Kong airport is very close at the moment, so I can't fly them anymore. Um, and I, yeah, so, um, the, the, the topic of, you know, producing more and more for me is something that is really hard to say. Um, but it's so tied into, you know, where you're supposed to be based and whether you're doing a European co-production, um, you definitely need to, you know, again, you need to get your Dutch producer or you need to get your German producer or your French producer or wherever the money can come from for your production. And that's always something that is becoming increasingly complex into sort of like defining the identity of the film that you're trying to make, which is really frustrating in times because um, I always write what the funds wants to read, um, but that comes from years of experience of, you know. <laughs> so take notes, please. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've been in the industry about 20 years, so it comes from years of experience talking to many different producers, filmmakers, funds themselves, seeing how the films work. But yeah, you know, a lot of people find it really hard to navigate what it means to do a co-production these days. And uh, yeah, so yeah. I'm working with Maiske on a lab in, with the Malaysian government starting next month to work with Malaysian filmmakers about how it is, you know, as a new filmmaker to come into the territories of international co-production. But also we want to look into co-production, not necessarily just with Europe. That's the traditional route because Europe has funds that allow for a lot of Asian films that cannot find money, art house, controversial, etc., etc. But also to look into the region and to collaborate more within the region because there's a lot of potential. and. Uh, Asia is actually very rich at the moment. Um, <laughs> it's just that it's very corrupt also. Uh, <laughs> and it's then managing a whole set of different sorts of... Uh, navigating very different sorts of landscapes that you have to figure out. Very different skill sets to navigate <laughs> European um, funding system. It's all very much paperwork, deadlines, you know, certain structures. In Asia, it's a lot more fluid and uh, a lot more <laughs> versatile you have to be. You so, a lot of equity uh, stuff. <laughs> equity, even government funding, you have to do different things to yeah. sort of like be put yeah. into the good books of uh, any sort of state funding that you're looking for. Mm. Yeah, I, I th it's very interesting what, what you're saying and definitely, and I think that uh, were collectively collaborating also was um, was dropped at the previous session. And uh, being a producer myself, I also have been, of course, uh, going back and forth continuously just to find a way to make the film that I want to make. So I definitely recognize, and, and I think uh, my most uh, horrible experience uh, with paperwork of European funding is Euromash. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's not anything to, to be offending, but it's just, you, you need, to, we say that you, you really need kind of need to reborn, you, to re, it's a rebirth to, to make that happen indeed where that's worth it to do that huge amount of work and to do all this administrative. But anyway, I would like to come back a little bit just to say, um, to see whether there is opportunities, there is like still possibilities despite all this kind of impossible uh, regulations and, and different cultural 
uh, uh, limitations of east and west to, to, to put the good, good things together, like Asia maybe has another way of uh, you know, uh, uh, producing or it's another type of resources and Europe has its own power. Maybe the, that, that uh, kind of strength can be combined if we use that will and um, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, uh, for that very specific aspect to go to like for instance, uh, both of you, um, because uh, you guys are collaborating on uh, important film of, uh, yeah, well, uh, Wang Xiaoshui, of course, for those who don't, do, I think he does not need much ex introduction. He's the sixth uh, generation of Chinese uh, film director. So uh, actually, I think, uh, yeah. So just would like to hear some from you and in the past, but also the current collaboration. Um. I'll, I'll <laughs> kick it off. Yeah, I think that, um, um, you became aware of Leontine as she was, at that moment, the chairwoman of uh, Bridging the Dragon, which yeah. was an initiative to bridge the gap between Europe and Asia in terms of uh, making feature films mm -hmm. together. And I think a couple of years ago, we came in touch also through the Match Factory, mm -hmm. uh, after having been aware of the work, we were obviously super honored to, to, to think on, on how we could collaborate. There was also a treaty which was being set up by some people that are also here to um, ensure a proper way of working between the Netherlands and China. And I think we are the first feature film that is making use of the treaty. So I think two or three years ago, we started mm. thinking about the collaboration before the pandemic. Mm. And we were also thinking to send Dutch people over to the set. And I think for me, yes, the differences can be uh, can be bigger, but I think that makes it super interesting and fascinating to find a common language in order to uh, to tell the f to 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 talk about the film and to to create the film together. So the initial plan was to send crew over for the shoot as well. Mm -hmm. So we did meetings here, uh, suggesting people uh, after reading, but due to COVID, it wasn't possible anymore to bring people to China at that point and. It was even uh, really special that the film was shot last year. And now we found people to do uh, the post-production. So the f from editing on, everything will happen in the Netherlands. And I think we found our way together looking for the right type of people who, even though they're, they, they, they maybe don't understand the language, but understand the film's language, understand the wishes of the director and the producer, and to collaborate in that way. and. Um, after the years of preparation we had, we are now uh, in the midst of that post process. And that's obviously, uh, it has been hubbly also through COVID, but it's also very special. So how is uh, your experience with this collaboration? Very interesting. Yes, um, the story starts, uh, I think, from uh, 2017 that uh, Alice and uh, uh, Michael Webb Werner uh, come to Beijing in 2007 and uh, we have a very uh, a good conversation about uh, the possibility of uh, co-production between China and Netherlands and uh, under the treaty and uh, at that time uh, we we just have an idea of this uh, above the dust uh, the film that uh, which is one of the trilogy of uh, Xiao Shui's uh, uh, works mm -hmm. so uh it's uh, and the main character uh is a uh, 11 years old boy which is very dutch uh a preference <laughs> so uh uh we suddenly find this like a uh, 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 sparkling there so uh mm -hmm. but it took a pretty long time because uh, we just uh, uh decided to shoot uh, solo on my son at the time and uh, but mm -hmm. i have this in mind so uh, after shooting that and in 2018 or 19 when i come to itfa and uh, i had this uh, meeting with lemming which is also recommended by a uh, netherland film fund and uh, so uh, usually for the first time, uh, we never work together. You know, co-production is a very trust-based thing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, like it's every, I know every film 
this, uh, the same situation. But during the dinner, with I remember clearly that uh, Eric there, me, uh, Liang Ting, and uh, another lady who's very beautiful from your country. I don't remember. Is he? I think it was Sarah. Oh, it's Sarah. <laughs> 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 okay. This is and live streamed, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the conversation just, uh, you know, like uh, suddenly we got this uh, confidence and trust uh, between each other, and so we just uh, started doing it. And uh, do, uh, from the beginning till now, uh, the whole experience is very pleasant, and uh, uh, I think it's very uh, fortunate for uh, for this film and also for director Wang Xiaoshuai, uh, because uh, everything changes after 2019, and especially uh, the Chinese film market is uh, uh, it changed a lot. And uh, uh, actually, for so long, my son, the uh, financing is not that uh, difficult for uh, for us. And uh, for this uh, above the dust, uh, not only uh, because of the subject, but also because of the whole market and have this uh, unstable thing. So, uh, uh, so we uh, am very glad to have this uh, fund from Netherlands, uh, which could uh, help us finish the post production uh, for this film. And luckily, we can finish it. So it will be a hybrid baby, no? Because. <laughs> I, I think because I'm in a hybrid uh, marriage, so my husband yeah. is uh, Dutch, but yes. we definitely have culture shocks at home. Yes. So it's like, uh, are there things which are less, uh, like, which are <laughs> it's not that easy? In this, you just try to, but I think this question will also be cast to you, Corinna, that like, because you, you are also producer of the film, which is not exactly from your own culture, but I just <laughs> wanted to throw this question. Um, into the group, so next to, of course, the good things, I'm sure, because I think that's why I think it's not that you, you know, you, you, you play with your own culture, you, you stay there, but you definitely, you go beyond to, to some, you know, out of your comfort zone to do something that is different. So I feel like going out of the comfort zone also comes with a prize sometimes, and uh, I have been producing films also sometimes in, in that way, like, uh, you know, sometimes lost in translation of some kind, not only language, but also cultural coding. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to see that, so of course, so good things, but what are the challenges or the things that you feel like, huh, there's something that will never work out? <laughs> <laughs> or, well, don't never say never, but uh, let's just, because I think there are young audience who wanted to learn probably from this kind of complex, but uh, meaningful process. Uh, I can go maybe first to, uh, yeah, we, we can do with you, but then I would like to come back to this because this is all ongoing. I think it's more interesting yeah. to talk about it at the end. Yes, yeah. yeah, so let's, let's mm. continue a little bit and then we'll go to yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the, <coughs> the differences, well, <laughs> the differences are there. And I think one of the main differences is where the financing is coming from, whereas it's more investor driven from China. We have public funding mm. with, uh, uh, with different expectations also in the outcome of it, yeah. and also different expectations in... So that that's already a thing of figuring out what is the, what are the demands for both sides, how do we structure to satisfy all needs. Uh, that's a very small example, but also culturally, finding a way to talk about scripts, finding, the, finding a language. Yeah. It's... it's um, that's... I don't know, I think that's more, it, you could mention it as a challenge, but that sounds negative. I think that's something to, that you find out during the talks. And um, mm. I think it was also different. <coughs> when I was, in 2019, I shot a film in Taiwan where we brought a Dutch crew. Mm. And there we tried to blend the Dutch way of production with the Taiwanese way of production. And that was more difficult because we were really mixing it in between the production. And now it's a little bit more separated where the film is coming to the Netherlands and we follow, basically we follow her lead in how, <laughs> how, how they want to work and we adjust a, a little bit. Mm. And there we try to find common ground. And then I think that was a way different experience and also a harder experience because we are very direct and sometimes we just want to hear <laughs> no. No is also an answer. So that was for me like understanding culturally 
um, um, how what kind of things were uh, the, the, yeah like, like losing face or not saying no or these kind of things were 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 um, uh, difficult in our shooting approach. So mixing the the set discipline of the Dutch mentality with in that case Taiwan <laughs> was for me mm -hmm. one of the biggest challenges. With above the dust, it has been. Oh, that. It, had, it, it has yeah. been uh, uh, easier. Maybe also I've learned from that experience. But we had time to talk for some years yeah. before we started. So I we found our common ground. Mm. Um, it takes time. So actually, it takes time to, to find each other. Yeah, yeah, to find it, to talk. How do you mm. normally do it? How do we normally do it? And then we find the best way for the project itself. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I I, I agree. It because we have enough time to uh, communicate with each other. And also I think uh, there's a, a problem uh, uh, in terms of uh, financing. Uh, the European funds is, uh, I think, is more um, reliable than uh, the fund from China. <laughs> so uh, uh, I feel uh, very happy that uh, uh, Lemming, Eric, uh, they trust us uh, to do it because uh, above the dust, it's not a very uh, low budget um, film. It, uh, it needs uh, a, a bunch of money to do it. So uh, we, we try to uh, finance uh, the production part, uh, the shooting part in China. But finally, uh, mostly from the pub, uh, the state fund. Actually, mm -hmm. it's not state; it's from Shanghai. And uh, uh, in 2019, mm -hmm. right before this pandemic, so uh, uh, fortunately, uh, then we've got uh, really relieved from the funding pressure on it. And then uh, uh, we used to talk about uh, discuss uh, that uh, uh, we bring a Dutch team to China. The, a sound team, and which is impossible because uh, the shooting was in 2020. Uh, used planned to be 2020, mm -hmm. and then it turns out 2021, mm -hmm. which is also impossible. So we just uh, uh, change uh, the the budget and uh, the yes the plan. So uh, mm -hmm. it's very flexible. So uh, I, I I think uh, the collaboration between us and uh, Lemming, there's never uh, any, uh, you know, like uh, any barrier. We just uh, talk this through. I don't think the European financing is so flexible, but I think there's room for it to be adjusted if there's situation like a pandemic happens. And but what I found really interesting was Xiao Shui was saying that you know how the co the editor that he's working with mm -hmm. now and and all the 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 creative and artistic collaboration is also going so well. So on top of sort of like the financing that comes with it, there's also another layer yeah. of collaboration yes. that is going so well, the, which I, I'm so happy to hear because yeah. it could go terribly wrong, yeah. but here it's going sounding to that's wonderful sounding mm -hmm. really good. So that's that's really the joy of co-production when things yeah. like that gels. Um, mm -hmm. And we we've been in places where things don't gel, you know. And and mm -hmm. no matter how hard you try to sort of like make them work, sometimes it doesn't want to be that one thing that you want it to be because everybody comes from very different backgrounds and very different agendas and everything. But here, it's there's a will to collaborate that is making it really good. And artistically, they also found sort of like a, a, a way to really match. So that sounds really wonderful. Yes, uh, when uh, things happen, like uh, we can't have uh, the, the editor we used to uh, <laughs> yes. To have a grey aunt, and <laughs> 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 so uh, things change. But also uh, the the sound, the team, things, everything. That uh, I am I'm, I'm lucky that uh, we have a, a director who is uh, who is happy, who is so adorable <laughs> 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 for us to to for us like these producers, you know, to easy. You know, to consider our position on the money side, you know, is very happy. So coming to the producer and filmmaker, mm -hmm. I think that you are together with your partner actually two roles in one, you know, in some kind. So how mm -hmm. how how did you experience this uh, this yeah very phenomenon film about the Myanmar? 
um, situation. Would you like me to talk about cultural differences or? No, I think it's yeah. like because you are not from there. No, yeah. Okay. So I guess it's more in that context. Yeah. Uh, how was well, that for you to produce yeah, that film? What's What's maybe good to say is that um, b uh, I work with Peter Lom, who's Czech and Canadian. So he he was born in Czech Republic, and then uh, with his parents, he fled the country. Uh, when the Russians invaded, and then so he, w as a baby, went to Canada and, and was raised there. Um, so he's more Canadian. And um, we always work together, and we have a big um, love for tutoring. So we, we love to coach and tutor young filmmakers. And um, when, the, uh, when, when the democratization process in Myanmar started, it was around 2010, uh, he was he, he's a uh, trained as a political scientist and became a documentary filmmaker but he was so uh, excited about this one of the last frontiers being opened because you have to imagine that in a country like Myanmar at that time there was no internet there were no international companies it was just completely open I mean you could go there as a tourist but it was kind of difficult and all of a sudden this country was opening up and then in 2012 if I'm not mistaken there was a Human Rights Film Festival for the mm. first time. Mm. And that was just so exciting. So uh, we got ourselves invited <laughs> oh. because uh, especially Peter really wanted to go there with a film we'd made in, um, in Egypt called Back to the Square, um, which they wanted to show. And actually not just in the capital, uh, not, not the capital, but Yangon, the biggest city, but also through the country. And then we said, well, if we're going there, can't we teach a masterclass? Because we also know that there's not many um, there is no film schools, there is no way to, to, to get a proper education. So we did one masterclass at the festival and we were so surprised because so many people showed up and the, the young filmmakers, uh, they all were so hungry to learn mm -hmm. from us and, to, to, and basically it was a no-brainer that um, when the festival said, well, we would like to do more of this, mm -hmm. that, we, that we immediately said yes to the... Um, to the proposal to go there for uh, three months to and then to work on short films with filmmakers from there, which is what we did. We were supposed to go with a dear colleague of ours, uh, Peter Wintonic, I don't know mm -hmm. if people who know here, who passed away mm -hmm. just a week before we were supposed to go, so that was a pity, but we, um, we then went together and that's how we kind of got into the culture. Of course, it's ve that, that was a big, uh, in the beginning, it was really kind of difficult because there's all these politeness things like uh, <laughs> um, we are not exactly diplomatic as Dutch people. And we were sitting in front of a class of very, very polite young uh, Burmese uh, students. And uh, I think it took us about two days to kind of set a new set of rules. Like there's no parroting. There's no like you repeat what I say, but you have an opinion. <laughs> and we, we basically had to explain to some of them the basics of human rights and why it's important to make human rights films because that was mm. specifically the course that we were doing, human rights filmmaking. And um, we were just, yeah, it was such a, such a special time there. It was... Uh, there was a fragile uh, transition to democracy. The young people that we met were so extraordinary, so smart. Mm. I mean, that's, um, you know, if, if you can generalize, I think that's a <laughs> generalization that in Asia, there's a lot of very, very talented and smart people. So uh, we were just very enthusiastic. And then we helped them to make short films. At that time, we also got an idea for a film of our own mm. to make a film about Burmese poets. Uh, dissident poets who had spent years of their lives in jail and basically were able to survive because of the poetry uh, that they w could still write in jail. So that was mm. the kind of uh, creative strength they got from um, their art. And uh, that was Burma Storybook, also distributed by uh, Cinema Delicatessa. And, uh, and, and so, we, but because of these young students, we got to know a lot of people in the art world there. And when last year, unfortunately, on the 1st of February, the, the coup was staged by the army, mm -hmm. that was just terrible because you could see all these dreams and all these opportunities that people had, they were oh. just stolen and, yeah. and taken away and bashed. So we were just really shocked. But that same afternoon, a group of young filmmakers came together and they said, we, we have to tell our stories to the outside world, which is extraordinary and brave. Mm -hmm. 
And a few days later, they approached us, like because some of them were our former students. And there is this um, tradition, I guess, that I, when you're a teacher, you're a teacher for life. So a bunch of them mm -hmm. had stayed in touch with us. And we still were always giving advice. And they asked me if I could produce, and Peter and me if we could coach them to make me and my diaries. Mm -hmm. And that's how we started working together. Um, so it's very much about trust. You also were talking about that in yeah. the last panel. That's the most important ingredient. Um, we were here in the net, well, wherever we were, we were working not in Myanmar. And, and uh, so we did everything online, mostly through encrypted uh, to signal. Mm. Um, and we coached long distance in the script writing, in the filming. It, it was documentary film, fiction, animation, all sorts of uh, different backgrounds for the, f for the makers. We didn't know them all. I mean, there was a, about half of them we didn't know. It's young men, young women. They would all stay anonymous, and everything in the film would be anonymous as a sort of a dogma to keep everybody safe. So those were kind of the only rules. Mm. And I guess that we were there to keep them uh, also healthy through filmmaking a little bit and to inspire creative freedom of expression under these horrible circumstances mm -hmm. that they were making the films through. And a year later, we premiered the film at uh, Berlinale and there it won the, the Berlinale Documentary Awards, mm -hmm. which is one of the biggest awards in the world mm -hmm. and one of the biggest encouragements that we could have ever given the filmmakers. Yeah. And, uh, and to make it a little bit round, so then you can maybe ask uh, if you are interested in knowing more. But uh, we are now with the filmmakers. Um, we, we're managing to get them out to, to see the film sometimes at festivals, like Movies That Matter here. There yeah. were three filmmakers mm -hmm. there. They are still anonymous when they go on stage. Mm. And um, we are together setting up a platform to uh, try to facilitate filmmakers who are in Myanmar to still get their stories out mm -hmm. in the world and to safe. find safe ways, safe mm -hmm. as possible, right? It's always a huge risk, mm -hmm. but uh, to, to produce their films and to mm -hmm. finance them and coach them and, mm -hmm. uh, and to give like uh, basic storytelling tools to s uh, um, civilian journalists because that's the, uh, the other thing that's also inside Myanmar Diaries is that uh, so many brave people in Myanmar, you, yeah, it's unbelievable. And when the army uh, commits their atrocities on the street, there's almost always someone there to film it with their mobile phone and put it on social media. So we want to also do something with giving tools to, um, to, to those people. And uh, I was just telling Dan, that I believe yesterday the, the, the president of the NUG, which is the underground government, the, the people's government, let's say, not the army, uh, said that because there's so much guerrilla war uh, going mm. on now, there's so many people decided to join the guerrilla armies mm. that they now say they have taken over half of the country. And that's also one of the stories inside Myanmar Diaries, right? So one yeah. of the uh, women filmmaker went into the jungle yeah. to film with the rebels and yeah. so, I guess that, and I started by saying that we are more coaching because that's how I see my production. I see mm -hmm. the producing much more as coaching and helping to set, to make the film a whole and, and to, um, so it's really a creative process mm -hmm. what, what we do. And we don't really do a lot of the standard uh, mm -hmm. producing and co-producing. Thanks. Okay, so I, th um, before I go to Dan, I would like to just kind of very briefly, because of course when you make a film, you want the film to be seen, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but before that, I just wanted to have a, like a between step, because I hear people, you, we started with saying like, uh, and, and Maiska and, and Lorna, you are collaborating on a lab for young filmmakers, I think they are the future. And sometimes maybe you couldn't do that alone. You, you need something from outside or from your own culture because of this or because of that, because of censorship, because of, and I guess just to get something from the ground and it, that could be in terms of indeed financing, but also expertise, for instance, that, you know, in Xiao Shui, of course, I guess he's an established filmmaker, um, but also in that creative process, some another culture could bring in you know, not only fun, but also another way of collaborating on, a, of course, a story that is set in China. So I see several keywords, I feel, that could kind of bring people together 
to, um, yeah, to, to do what they could or they wanted to do. And, and same as you, um, Corina, that you are coaching. It's basically, you give them a platform, you give them some kind of support, so that you know, in such a situation of Myanmar, I guess, otherwise they would probably get stuck. I don't know much of that, but I know, of course, I, I work with Afghanistan. I work with yeah. Afghan filmmakers. No, it's when, Afghan, when Afghanistan collapsed, it's also people feel really stuck because there's the, they, they, their voice are muted. And so I guess to get the voice out there, Sometimes you can't do that alone. So I, I just wanted to kind of wrap, just to say it's, it's quite very powerful that we could kind of multidisciplinarily work together in funding, in expertise, and, and when a film is, of course, made, finally. Mm. I think, well, this is my baby, you know? And now I'm going to give this to the wild world. Okay, and of course, Berlinale and all this festivals and they give a launching pad, but uh, after that, of course, it will hopefully go into certain channels to be seen. And not only because festival is always very, I mean, it's just this week or this few days, like Cinema Asia. And so then, uh, as a Dutch di distributor, I think um, it's quite difficult, no? To get a film <laughs> to the Netherlands, to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in particular, with is, this there, is, is there like okay? Is, is there some kind of hope for foreign films to get into the Netherlands in one way or another? American films have no problems. <laughs> <laughs> Who has no problems? American, <laughs> American films, yeah, they're very popular at this at this moment. No, I mean, I mean, definitely, and then like with recent films, uh, Asian films like Parasite, Shoplifters. You know, or even like a Sundance, it was it's all that breeze documentary from India, which won like a big award there. I mean, they definitely find their place here. But with these kind of films like Mio <laughs> Diaries, it's clearly a little bit more difficult to find uh, an audience. Um, also, because we notice with this one, I'm a little bit surprised because it, it wins all these awards at Berlin, at uh, Movies That Matter, it's screening here. Um, but the Dutch press finds it difficult to apparently give. A film about Myanmar and like a lot of a lot of attention we mm -hmm. noticed or a little bit less than we expected at least and for example it was like a Dutch television news program who said yeah it's, you know it's all very bad what's going on there but with Ukraine now going on so we have our own problems here exactly too. and <laughs> the film is actually about this right like that with it's just one year ago and we forgot about that something is going on there at all um, I mean, but the <laughs> very <laughs> negative story. Sorry, but I give you immediately a very confronting question. So. No, but I mean, you know, but so we're trying, I mean, this film is a very important film, this one in particular then I find, and this is why we're trying to give it a platform in cinemas, actually from today. Mm. So yeah, very happy to, you know, to have it at, at a festival here and before Movies That Matter, so you can really find certain audiences already to kind of kickstart the cinema release. Um, but it's difficult to, you know, to give this kind of, of documentary films a path, and in particular now in the current climate, because it's it's really like some films take all the audience, um, like and even more than before. I saw like uh, recent numbers, and it's really more and more that like five or six films are taking, I don't know, fifty six percent of the audience in cinemas, um, and people are having difficult difficulties finding their way back into into the art house cinemas in particular mm. so commercial cinema seems to be doing all right with all these bigger films uh, playing now uh, the problem is also cinemas like art house cinemas or cinemas like the independent cinemas in this country are playing you know spider-man and and everything and and that reduces the number of screens that are available for mm. the independent art house films um, the cinemas have been closed, so they need to survive. So they need, feel the need to play Spider-Man, and then you know mm. because they want more seats. So it's it's a cycle, a very vicious cycle, of of, of reducing um, the audience because there's no trust in the audience to be going for films like that. But mm. the and therefore without trust, the audience is reduced, and it's. I, I mean, I could, I could. <laughs> this is my story. I always tell people, yeah, but, but yeah. I'm, but I'm. You know, it's a very pessimist way, but it is. It is like that. They're yeah. screening more and more commercial stuff, I find, and they say it's because they need to get their audience back. I, I, you know, I 
I can I understand yeah. that Sometimes that story. Sometimes there are five Netflix films in the cinema, and I'm like, okay, great, you know, to want to experience it on the big screen too. But it's also on bloody Netflix, right? And mm. I I have nothing against Netflix, but uh, you know, we also need the space for diversity of films, and and it's mm. really a big problem when subsidized venues are really going the commercial route. I mean, nothing. Sorry, to, I, I, nothing I, to add to I that. Really, I can't be critical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're the distributor. Yes. You still have to be. Lorna, I uh, definitely I agree with you. But uh, I think uh, our audience are watching TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, and it's the same. It's different in China, but China uh, there's never art house cinema. Oh, art house cinema are shown Bohemian Rhapsody. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, so uh, I think that's why we need festival. We need to uh, get together and uh, to do the, uh, including uh, co-production and uh, to promote this kind of, because uh, this kind of film have uh, mm -hmm. uh, the meaning of education, uh, meaning and everything and culture. Everything. Yeah, and that's why me it and Mike, uh, we are both kind of also playing the exhibitor roles ourselves because most of the time when as producers we want to get our film seen, we have to mm -hmm. do the work. Maiska runs Kinosaurus in Jakarta to show independent art house films, uh, whether virtually or pop-up certain times. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, in Indonesia, there's no local distributors. You mm -hmm. have to distribute the films yourself, for example. Okay. And for me, I worked as a producer for a long time, and then I started working in festivals because I have to understand how the festivals work. I have to try to penetrate them, and then I try to get my films there, or the films of my friends in there. And then I want to try to you know, be able to also stimulate festivals to look differently for what is a festival film, you know? What, what qualifies as a festival film? What is a good film for the critics, you know? It's, and it's all, you know, so much that needs to be changed in our changing world that is still, you know, we're talking about yeah. canons that never change, you know? What is, you know, the classic films? Orson Welles, again, over and over. Ozu, when you talk about, you know, like uh, Kurosawa. And then we're back to the same old man all over again and again and again. And, so it's very important as producers to also get into that act of really rebelling against the system as much as we can, in as nice as we can. Yeah, as functional as we can, I would yeah. say as well. So by saying that, I also would like to, because I know Edwin's film that we will be screening at our closing night uh, is on Netflix, if I am not mistaken. Not here yet in Europe. No, okay, <laughs> not, not available yet in Europe. But uh, as but because I uh, been a producer, I also am actually advisor at a production at, at a sales company at a sales agent company. Through that, actually, I I understood much better as you said, uh, Nora. You have to penetrate. You can you have to understand whom we are we talking to, and who is buying, who is not buying. What are they buying? So it's like I'm, I'm definitely also trying to f understand uh, how this uh, on-demand service, which doesn't seem to have a very clear curation, if I may say so, <laughs> it's all there, where is this obviously curated. And so I'm, I'm just also kind of learning like how film as such you know, find its way into both, of course, the big uh, Lucano, it's a uh, winning film of Lucano Film Festival. The as Golden well, Leopard. Golden Leopard, yeah. And, but also the platform like this, you know, and I just wanted to see you as a producer, how you kind of window them, or do you window them? Can you window them? Hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I think, uh, like, if we talk about uh, vengeance, I mean, vengeance also, I mean, I can make vengeance through, like, you know, a lot of experience before. And as, you know, like, we all say in here, like, with the producers, we need, uh, like, we, ha we, we need this kind of forum to talk about co-production, for example. I mean, I remember it, it was in 2007 when I started uh, producing film with Blind Pig. And in Indonesia, we don't have like any system for film, anything at all, no system, basically just cinema. Um, so like the European funding, they help us to, 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 to be able to voice our film and to, mm. to, to, to give the space for the film. 
And then also for the second feature for uh, of Edwin, I mean, uh, uh, Lorna is my partner uh, for postcards from the zoo. And again, at that time, this is also talking about the changes uh, within That's production. Good. Like it was again uh, until 2012, we when we make film, we still pretty much rely heavily on European funders. And that's the, the, the reality. If you want to go yeah. that way, I mean, that's the only voice as a producer. I cannot avoid that. But then, um, you know, you got to learn about uh, all these labs, all these project markets, all these funders. And then you understand you have to be the one that, you know, actively, you know, do, do everything yourself. And actually, like, that's also the reason why I did... Uh, you know, distribution and also uh, exhibition in Indonesia because as a producer, you know, if you want to get the film flowing, you, you kind of have to do it yourself then. So I'm pretty much trying to do many things in Indonesia is simply because of that, because we don't have the system. The government, they don't recognize film as, you know, something that is priority. I mean, we still have like poverty, for example, as a big issue in Indonesia. So anyway, uh, Going back to vengeance, like through this experience, I, you know, at some point after postcard from the zoo, then I realized, I mean, I cannot sustain with this kind of like mode of work with re relying on the European, for example. So we, I have to invent, I mean, like not inventing, but I really have to try to work with investors because this is the profile of the, the Indonesian, uh, you know, feature. Uh, we rely on investment on making everything mm. and including film. Um, so that's why with Vengeance that, you know, having the experience, uh, learning from Lorna and uh, all these uh, festivals like forums like this, then in Vengeance uh, we, we managed to put from 100% financing into 60% uh, investment from Indonesia and 40% uh, grants from, from, from Europe. Mm. From Europe. We and also some from Asia. Yes. 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 So <laughs> the the investment it will be from Indonesia and Singapore. Mm. So like I mean that's also the changing that I would like to highlight. Like this region, the Southeast Asia. Yay! I remember Southeast Asia. <laughs> yes. This is very, very I mean, interesting. Like yeah. I remember like 2008 when I released my film Postcard from New Zoo. We had to sit. I literally brought buyers into my hotel room in Rotterdam <laughs> as a way of selling, trying yeah. to sell um, blind pigs from the zoo first because yeah. we were new, we didn't know how yeah. to do sales and we didn't yeah. have sales agents. So I knew some buyers, I brought them to my hotel room, come to my room, watch your film. <laughs> That's how we started with... Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, and now, I mean, cut to like... 10 years after 2022, we can see like wooden pictures from Thailand, they have a support cash. Uh, we have Singapore with the co-production The grant. ASEAN Singapore co-production grant mm. and yeah. the Filipinos have and the Philippine. FDCP, ICOF and ACOF for yeah. international. Yeah, so, so now like after like all these decades, then finally we have these uh, grants in Southeast Asia and with Vengeance, I do tap into the Southeast Asian grant and so I no longer, I mean, of course, I still have uh, funders from Germ uh, from Europe and I have a partner uh, with Match Factory Production and the sales agent, the Match Factory, so I still have that relationship, of course, but also I'm able to gain more from the region, mm -hmm. for example. And as you as you say, also like you experience with, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, with, with, uh, with your film, how, you know, like probably from this part of the world, like Indonesia, um, investment is, you know, the, the, the variables, yeah, yeah. like the, 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 the points of like, you know, like to make this co-production mm. moving as much as the European with the grants. Mm. Probably, I mean, of course, there are details, uh, as Eric mentioned, there are um, requirement, requirements that you need to fulfill for, for every partners, but, I think that's also another thing why, you know, at the end of the day, at uh, the trust between the mm. filmmakers when they are discussing the artistic, that's actually like the key, like mm. kind of the filter. If you manage to go through that, 
financing is, I mean, I won't say it's simple, but it's manageable, you know. You, you can work out with the financing. Mm -hmm. But I think like getting to discuss the idea and the artistic, I think that's the most crucial part. And then, you know, kind of determine whether you're going to survive the partnership or not. Mm, that's really interesting. And I think what, so we, we, we came across, I think several times, uh, the point that Asia, and of course, it's just, Asia is just not, uh, like we have the content and idea, but also a substantial resource can come from that continent. I think that was not like 50 years ago, maybe yeah. it was not quite the case. And, and I also, from my own experience, I know that there are big, uh, okay, in a more commercial documentary context, uh, actually the local content, yesterday I had an funny uh, conversation with National Geographic and uh, they, uh, they, they were saying like, if it is not relevant, a National Geographic Asia, they used to buy everything and whatever. But now they say if it's not local relevant, there is no interest. So that means basically, I, I, I feel that Asia is becoming also a, a, a cultural entity in that, also for this kind of pan-regional channels and platforms and uh, yeah, so, but I would like to come back a little bit to the point like, no. The distribution, I think, uh, because uh, when you spend so much time, so much energy, and some and for documentary, I'm pretty much like uh, I'm from that context. So I think like it's it's very mostly a very small budget, and it takes probably longer sometimes just to 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 to, to put a story together. I just find sometimes it's remain not seen, I, but that's more like I just wanted to spend a little time like. Uh, also with, with, with my school, but with all of you, in terms of like, uh, if you get a film produced, what would be, let's say, the way also to get it out there? And is there something uh, that we could talk about also from Asia, from, because Asia is a populated continent, and also all these streaming platforms, uh, they care to kind of get Asia, you know? But just to put this in the context of distribution, I would like to go a little bit a, ra a small round for those who have experience with this. Uh, I can start. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, I think with streamers, with platform, this is something that also discussed in Indonesia because I mean, you, might, you know, as much as we are a big population, all the foreign uh, platforms are coming to Indonesia. Um, I would say, I mean, this is like the challenge. I always like ask them, how many films can you absorb? you know, actually, because I think that's determined whether they are significant or not. I mean, it, for example, with these streamers, they have library. Of course, they, it's like a vacuum cleaner, they, you know, kind of suck like all films. But when, when it's only a library, what's that mean for filmmakers? It doesn't mean anything. I mean, you know, it's not like literally doesn't mean anything. But for us, I would say my question will be, how many films original that you really produce in Indonesia. Because at the end of the day, if it's only less than five, it's, it, I mean, it doesn't really significant for us, for the industry. The cinema, they can absorb like 150 films in a year. So if, you're, if the streamers only like, you know, give out mm. like the best only less than five, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's, it's a, the presence is, I would say it's not significant. Mm. That's from the filmmaker's point of view. But for the audience, I think again in Indonesia, the internet also penetration is not that good as in Europe, for example. I, I mean, see. you can really do everything online everywhere. Mm. But in Indonesia, it's a different case. I mean, there are lots of, you know, the areas that it's not, I would say, I mean, it's manageable uh, to access the internet. But if it's more like what's up, for example, mm. not necessarily watching films. Mm. So I think uh, as much as they want to eagerly, you know, get this, all the customers, I don't think it's uh, easy. I would say Indonesia, and I've been reading in Europe, for example, in France, how the streamers, and also like in Switzerland recently, that they can really negotiate, you know, very in good, yeah, in terms of like, you know, the financing. But again, it goes back to Indonesia. For me, the streamers is one of the, I mean, we, we have time when, when the TV are the buyers. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I would see like the streamers at this moment is like that. I mean, I they don't, I mean, it's not like 
replacing for me is still cinema is the biggest uh, in Indonesia and there of course we have to recognize them because it's complementing how the audience behavior at this moment mm. okay. very interesting how is that uh, uh, I think in China it's, it's uh, China is always different uh, situation <laughs> Uh, it's a let's, on its own. Mm, yes, <laughs> let's just pretend there is no censorship and uh, every film can get their uh, release in China. Because, uh, if, uh, because with the censorship, I think uh, all things just change. You couldn't even get anything out of the film because uh, you, you couldn't get a uh, permission. So uh, it's another problem. So uh, let's pretend it's uh, really uh, no censorship country. And uh, then, uh, yes, it's, it changes a lot from uh, 2013 uh, when we uh, made a film <coughs> named uh, Red Amnesia. Uh, the film screen was here in Cinemasia? <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's Red Amnesia, <laughs> yes, the, the film. And so uh, uh, at the time, the film was in uh, Venice uh, main competition, and uh, the box office of uh, in, uh, in China is 10, 10 million, 10 million. Uh, but uh, we spend 12 million for distribution. So uh, it's obviously uh, it's not profit, and uh, but from the internet at the time, uh, it's four million for this film. Mm -hmm. uh, it's around 2014, 15, and uh, but after that, uh, we uh, I produce another film, which is uh, in uh, Tai uh, Taiwan Golden Horse and uh, won two awards there. And uh, um, the box office, uh, it was 2016 or uh, 2017, two years, uh, uh, three years later. The box office uh, is a, a very small film. And the box office is uh, two million, which is obviously we can't get anything out of it. Uh, but, uh, the internet uh, we get is the same with Red Amnesia, is four million. So uh, for this film, we, we can take uh, all the expenses back because of uh, the international, uh, internet. And, uh, but the film, the international uh, distribution is not so good. Uh, uh, so uh, that's all. But anyway, we uh, we have a balance there. So uh, mm, for so long, my son, uh, this film we we've got uh, some experience. Uh, we asked the the distributor, which is uh, pretty familiar with us and uh, work uh, closely with us, and uh, we control all the the expenses of uh, distribution within uh, ten million, and uh, the box office is uh, fifty million more than 50 million and but uh, still no profit <laughs> and uh, but at the time the distributor which is also the uh, distributor for uh, all this uh, main theme uh, film like uh, uh, Chang Jin Hu, mm. everything <coughs> like that mm. Uh, mm. The, the big film is a, a very uh, a uh, big uh, distributor in China, and mm. they uh, predict uh, double at least uh, for this film, the box office. So, uh, uh, in that way, the internet turns out to be uh, uh, s uh, very low. It's only uh, six million mg, because uh, they expect it high. Uh, then uh, they expect it to be like uh, at least uh, 12, 15 million uh, with with the jump uh, according to the box office. Yeah. Am I clear? <laughs> yeah, but uh, so, uh, so it's, uh, yes. So, so it's difficult to be profitable. <laughs> yes, so it's, so 
Yes, <laughs> yes, and、uh, it's really random. Yeah, it's not. It, you cannot just take well, it as a. I think it started with、uh, Black Coal Thin Ice, Tiao Yinan's film that won the Golden Bear in Berlin. Yes, and then there was a lot of very nationalistic approach to making sure that the film did really well in the box office. Uh, and 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 I was in forums in China where it was talking about how we must make everyone see this film as a national treasure. So that was part of the sort of like campaign. So there are different ways of campaigning in China, you know. And、uh, and I, it with begins a long day into night. It was、mm-hmm. really selling it as a romantic、uh, Valentine's、yeah. Day special sort of、uh, film, and then everybody wanted the their、Christmas、money back. The Christmas night. Ah,、uh, yeah, Christmas. <laughs> which, uh, and then everybody wanted their money back, but you know you can't get your money back once it's gone. <laughs>、um, and then,、uh, but yeah, they 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 went they went like pre-sales was high, and then the,、yeah. the day after release it was like, yeah. Nothing. So China is a very funny thing, also because so many tickets are done through online ticketing now.、Yeah. So online ticketing is controlling how tickets are being sold and how films are being viewed in China,、yeah. which is a completely different game than the rest of、yes. the world. China is always、uh, like that、uh, in that sense, from size, but also from its own regulation or that point of view. And、yes. I would like to go slowly, like to round it up. But I, I, would, I, I think. Then,、uh, because you are the distributor, so、um, in the Netherlands, so the foreign film,、uh, it's difficult. I mean, especially documentaries, because I think,、uh, uh, and and I just wanted to ask,、uh, just give a short answer as to why it's like that. And it's,、uh, I mean,、um, yeah. Maybe it's, it requires a long answer, but I, I was like, it is because it's too far away, or it's because、uh, it's documentary, or it's because. Well, I mean, I guess <coughs> I guess foreign films are not a problem per se. The documentary is, I mean, it's getting more popular. I think, actually think because of the streamers also, yes, and more bigger budgets. But what you see now more and more coming is, you know, they're called like the golden age of documentary film, which I, I mean I don't agree with because what you see more and more now is all these kind of.、Um, Format docs,、mm-hmm. you know, like、mm. the biographies, which、mm. are all the same, and、yeah. all these kind of、um, Netflix-ish films, and they do well in cinemas mostly.、Okay. But more creative kind of documentaries, or even creative films, I would say, they have much more difficulties finding audiences, and it's it's both with, with what you know cinemas or streamers are showing, which is、uh, more, I would say, easygoing,、yeah. you know, and more feel good. Maybe it's also what's going on in the world; people want to see more. Easy stuff.、Mm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying that you know, but maybe this is, it is what people think at least, and this is what why we, you know we're, we're giving that more and more to them. What the gatekeepers, and also then we have the issue of the press, which are then being forced by their editorial line to go more and more. So you look at、yeah. Cannes next week; everything is about fucking Tom Cruise. And, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. Tom Cruise going to Cannes, but you're only reading about Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise, and then you're like going a bit crazy because Cannes is supposed to be there to. Yeah, you, yeah. Because no, the, it, the that's press、true. and the press needs to cover only the movie stars.、Mm-hmm. So again, our cycle. Of, so what do we do? Where where is the solution? So, yeah. yeah. And、mm. indeed, and also I guess also、uh, like Lemming Film, of course, is one of the companies which collaborate quite a bit also、uh, with、uh, foreign partners. I would say on foreign films. And、uh, how do you see that? And and like、uh, because I think. Really,、uh, yeah. Of course, this is a long discussion,、mm-hmm. but I definitely feel this curation also. But also, like film critics from that last year, also I had a film at Cannes. Nobody wanted to write it about it. Really, it's a documentary. It's yeah.、Um, it's all like you can't find a journalist who who says, "Well, I'm going to write the、yeah. competition film." So that's how it is. No, it, it's it? difficult both for majority films from the Netherlands, but also for foreign films we co-produce. It has been the last two years been super hard. I think what we have done, we had a really popular Swedish film, which was called Pleasure, which was in Cannes and Sundance, and it was about the sex industry. I had very high expectations、mm-hmm. that, in terms of box office, it would perform due to all the press and all the prices, and, and it was very accessible. But it completely crashed as well. So, what we try to do is 
combine a regular release with uh, what you call a little bit hybrid, what you see a lot in documentaries for the smaller films we do, meaning we do a tour where we invite the filmmakers, even foreign filmmakers, to accompany the film because we see then, then it's a special screening, so people attend. And we now make deals, and luckily the Dutch Film Fund is helping in that because they protect the 12-week window before we can sell it to streamers, but we are pre-selling our films to go to the streamer 12 weeks after theatrical mm. and then going to television. So we're using the windows a little bit right. different, mm. combining festivals, um, uh, theatrical, VOD, and TV to all together find our audience. But um, I wish, I mean, what we have been looking for is more positive examples in the last years of breakout art house hits that cleared a way for more films to do so. Mm. But I think everyone is fighting and I think we're in the midst of finding new ways to reach that audience mm. and uh, being uh, t staying optimistic in the meantime by mm. working for these films and making sure that people see these important films. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of like challenges. Ask, I mean, like, <laughs> of course, it, it, there, it, it Films, you know, some film releases are very hopeful, you know. I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know if they're happy with it, but like, like Drive My Car, yeah. which is like a very, it's a very long film, right? And, but I think it has like over 40,000 admissions here, which yeah. I mean, to me, I mean, I don't know, I didn't. Even, three hour Japanese yeah, I mean, I didn't invest in that film, so I don't know what, what their, you know, um, hopes yeah. were, but that seems like a really good uh, yeah. turn up, and particularly in these days, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are very good examples of, you know, and of course, this is why I'm also still distributing films. Because every <laughs> every year you have a couple of those surprise hits, mm -hmm. you know, and gives you hope for other kind of um, creative films to mm -hmm. find audiences. Yeah, I guess that um, for, for me, my diaries is basically too early because it's coming out in the cinema today, so we mm -hmm. we expect a lot of. Uh, <laughs> but but what is uh, really cool is. Uh, that, that we've been so lucky from the beginning with getting the right people on board. I mean, that's I so see. important. And, mm. you have, that, that's, and I think it's just also the quality of the film, but we have Outlook Film Sales, which is a boutique uh, film sales agent, just really excellent. And they're also doing the programming of the film festivals, which is, of course, um, sometimes a little bit like unexpected, especially for the filmmakers from Myanmar, that they have to, for example, wait to distribute the film in Asia because it's going to first have its Asian premiere in Busan. Yeah. But, uh, and I think you were referring to that earlier. Um, but they are really doing a strategy, and, uh, and the film is going to be shown in an enormous amount of fes festivals mm. and probably going to be uh, sold to TV, but that's a bit too early to say exactly where. And um, I, b and but if you don't, I, I don't really know about the money. I, I think it's kind of difficult to make money with documentaries. So we're fortunate enough to be in a country where you can pre-finance a little bit, even though this was a low-budget film. But what's really exciting, for example, is that through social media, people in Myanmar have heard about the film. Mm. And of course, it's unthinkable that a, a TV station there would broadcast it, but. Mm. There is BBC and there is uh, DVB, the Democratic Voice of Burma, who reach uh, an enormous amount of uh, people every day. Mm. And it's like an underground um, broadcasting system, right, online. And, it's, and you can now go to jail for, I believe, three years for having a VPN. Yeah, but every... Yes, many. The, the, yeah. the, film, the, film, the filmmakers are being targeted, yeah. artists, yeah. filmmakers, producers. So it's really awful, but but it's everybody's so stubborn. They still own VPNs. So what we now said is, once the film has had its um, festival life, and, uh, and and we think that the filmmakers would be safe enough to show the film there, because it's ultimately their own decision, then DVB is going to broadcast it, and then we expect to reach seven or eight million people there. So that's a that's an enormous amount of people and. Something like that already makes me very, very happy, you know? Yeah. Okay. So please tell everyone to go and watch me and my dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so and really we still have many days in Cinemasia here. Yes, yeah. yeah. that's... Morning. that's <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thanks. Sunday afternoon with a Q&A. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. In the Bay, <laughs> in the Alto. <laughs> Yeah, twice, yeah. two Queen We're also, uh, <laughs> before that, uh, also, once our shots film, my solo, my son will have, it's like a single screening. Uh, it's so also, 
It's, uh, but it's sold out, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There will be Q&A. <laughs> yes. So and while well, for so long, my son, it was, uh, 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 the word sell is really good uh, by the match factory. It's, yeah. Uh, yes, it's, uh, since, uh, since Beijing Bicycle is the best, uh, best one for the international distribution. Now it's owned by Movie. Uh, it's not, still two separate entities, <laughs> so they say. We don't go into that discussion. Yeah. So I think it's time to wrap. Uh, thanks so much. But I would like to leave five to ten minutes for Q and A because, uh, for actually also for questions uh, and which uh, would would need to be addressed not only by this second panel but also the first panel. Uh, and so for all the burning questions. But, I, but just to wrap, I think it's really interesting to hear all different kind of aspects, different ma markets, there are hope. There are definitely hope. <laughs> but uh, there are also things that we feel it's confronting. But I think, uh, I feel that cinema will stay, no? <laughs> Let's leave with that remark. And I would like to open the, yeah. So there's no, Yes, please. So if I understand it correctly, your question is how to make a, a, an artistic successful film, which also get to be seen. <laughs> Uh, I guess maybe just each of you, like one sentence. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's another panel on its own. Um, yeah. Maybe Lorna. <laughs> uh, um, thank you for your question. I think uh, this, uh, your question is all the film lover want to ask. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But uh, it's what we are trying to, to do, to uh, make the good film to reach more audience. We are trying. We hope we won't let you down. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, more questions coming. Okay, yeah, here you go. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Chi Mo. I'm a Facebook photo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, my question may be a little more personal because uh, uh, I'm Chinese and I lived in the Netherlands for five years for like uh, uh, art study, so just graduated from art school in uh, Utrecht. But uh, mainly I'm focusing on photography and the filmmaking myself. And as a young, just graduated artist and filmmaker, like of course during the uh, current time, there was a lot of obstacles for us, like for start up even more and uh, due to our, um, my own country, China. So there's really more difficulties for me to connect, to connect with our um, local film production makers and even artists and exhibitions. 
So I made a, a graduation film, went to some film festivals, but uh, I just feel it's really hard to make some connections back in China. And uh, somehow like, my identity as a Chinese also in a bizarre way lost in the Netherlands about <laughs> some time. So maybe I, my question is like, maybe you can give me some advice on how to, like, as a star art filmmaker, like, in, Oh. Whom do you want to ask this question to? Uh, you're the best one. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, yes, you're Chinese okay. and you're based in Netherlands. I think we can, for that question, I'm happy to, uh, thanks for the question. I think I really recognize this uh, from a lot of first time. I work quite a bit with first time filmmakers. Uh, I think it's very tough to, for them to really find a way and, uh, and uh, I, I think it's, uh, I don't have a, like a one-size-fits-all kind of answer, but I definitely feel you should team up with someone um, like who shares the same kind of aesthetic with you. Uh, I definitely would recommend you to have a producer. It doesn't have to be a super experienced producer, but it has to be, I think, some, just to discuss things with, just to start with, that's maybe the lowest hurdle, because the established producer maybe they have too many things to do. Um, and, and then you start from there, but uh, it, it, but also talk with your filmmaker friends, maybe who are a little bit maybe already down, a little bit further down the line to see how they kind of make make to that point <laughs> would help too, um, as to that you feel that you are losing your cultural connection. I really think that um, is something, yeah, that is happening. <laughs> I guess there is not really a solution to that. Just because if the country stay closed, I guess you can't, mm. you can't go, no? <laughs> yeah. I think one of the most important things when you're starting out is you must build your own tribe, your own community. Yeah, exactly. You know, find the people that, you know, are, you know, in, 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 in that you feel connected with, that you feel you can go on the same journey with yeah. and, and, and work together. Uh, yeah, it's it's it. Then go come to events, go to festivals, go to talk sort of with like, people, talk with yeah. people, connect. There's there's many things happening online also, which is alienating. But at the same time, you can also benefit from it if you really want to learn and if you really want to connect. So you need to put yourself out there a little bit. But you know, if you find your your people, find your tribe, work with them. Uh, it takes time. It's not, not going to happen overnight. But you, and build your body of work, you know. Yeah. First film doesn't work, yeah, then make some more. Make <laughs> until it gets you somewhere. And also I think yeah. make something that is close to you and that you are really passionate about. Yeah. Uh, and don't try to do, you know, too far-fetched stuff because you, you know, I think that's try to get people with you for what really matters to you. There. I, I, there are a lot of so. <laughs> I agree with that, and I also think that maybe answers partly the first question: how you can make something artistic also mm -hmm. business. Yes. commercial value. If you make something personal, and you're the only one that can tell it, it has a bigger chance maybe to reach a larger audience because they share the same feeling in a different way. If that makes sense. Yes, definitely. Mm. Thanks. Yes. yes. Well, my name is and uh, I kind of have like a follow-up to this question on, on, uh, on you who just spoke, which I found very uh, inspiring because I'm also a student from uh, Utrecht, uh, from the arts uh, school. And how are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, still, uh, I'm a second year uh, audio visual. So you can do you, 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 you guys never met? Yeah. Yeah, just team up. <laughs> Films now, I really try to, um, you know, always put like uh, or represent like people that look like me. You know, I, I, I really try to represent more Asian faces in, in media. And it's quite hard because we live or, or we are, are in a pretty white school where you might be like the only, you might be like the only like drip in the soup or something. You might just sort of, you know, uh, fade away in there. And well. Of course, I, I find it really inspiring that you are here. And, and, uh, <laughs> here, you see, here, you see, it happens. <laughs> and, uh, my more specific question that I wanted to ask you on the board is like, uh, right in the moment 
now I'm also making a film that is about uh, youngsters that are from difficult households that find their second home on the street. Uh, this is a film that's very close to my own uh, experiences from coming from a home where there was a lot of frustration and uh, not possible to sort of like express these feelings. And for this film I really wanted to uh, find uh, actors with an Asian background. Um, They are, there are not so many. Yeah, well, <laughs> see, like, and now I've connected so many people, and for me it's like, where, where can I find these actors, you know? Mm. I mean, here! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, actually tomorrow we have, it's not tomorrow, right? It's tomorrow. Yeah, we have a pitch at, at four here. Uh, we have a pitch forum, and that actually is selected project for short films uh, act uh, of, uh, I, think, I think all these authors are, have an Asian background. Uh, I definitely would like to, yeah, invite you to participate. I think it is for free, right, Doris? <laughs> you have to register <laughs> on the film. It's the film lab pitch session tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. No, no, uh, the, the pitch have been sort of like selected, so, uh, <laughs> but here. definitely yeah. it's a, 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 an opportunity to network with other people who are pitching maybe. And also professionals, I think yeah. there are like several, I, I, will be, I will be there as well. Um, so yeah, please come. Okay, oh there's, there are more questions, I think, so. Um. My question also a little bit. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, the more people who find each other, yeah. looks like. <laughs> um, but this is a bit on the other side. Uh, I'm a Dutch filmmaker who happens just to look Chinese. Wait, where did that come from? I've lived here for 35 years, so I'm a bit Dutch. I've done the Dutch Film Academy one of the few Asian people who went there. Um, now, there's like lots of talk about diversity and we want Asian representative uh, actors, producers, directors, something. And I'm more like, I don't want to be like shoehorned into only doing Asian stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I can talk about a little bit about background and stuff, but I'm also, as a director, I want I have some uh, short movie about a uh, lesbian couple. So that's totally different than just um, they, were, they were not Asian. But one was Belgian, another was a Dutch woman. So, so um, your I question is? So your your you you have a question? Actually, more for the producers. Okay. Yeah, they are full of. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> We're coming to a new dawn. Uh, uh, the film fund is launching a new dawn. You can talk to them about it. We don't have a film fund rep here, so we can't answer your question. Uh, I, yeah, uh, this is so, uh, you know, this is n being shoehorn is 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 what the industry does. You know, the industry n needs to be able to sort of like assign people into what they feel, you know, because there's a certain standards and sets and everything. And it's, it's everyone's sort of like work and, you know, to, to go out there and, and try to navigate that and, and find yourself where you belong. Um, I, that's, I, I don't know how to tell you that you cannot, you, how, if you don't want to be just stereotyped into doing Asian stories only or, or being labeled as an Asian filmmaker here. Um, but what is wrong with being that also? Oh, no, the, the, um, especially now with the, the emphasis on diversity. And I think it's great that now the Asian directors are getting chances to direct uh, Dutch movies. 
and I know that Simon did produce the Kung Fu Hill, the 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 used um, low production Dutch China about the youth who doing a little bit of Kung Fu. Uh, sorry, I'm not familiar that with that. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but I really see this like um, very long, 20 years, and now only with the diversity, she got a chance to produce and direct the movie. Mm. Now there's a change going on, and I think wait for uh, for 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 the for the. For the uh, I think if you have a good story to tell, and you work well at making the story the best that you can be. And, and work with good people around you, there's, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that there's a way to it. That I, I, I know that people like to label and people like to, but your story needs to be solid in the first place. Everything ultimately that we do as producers, you know, must come from what is crucial is the story and the people around the story that is gonna make this story happen. Mm -hmm. So you need to then equip yourself making the best possible story with a really damn good script and work with the best people for this story to be told the best possible way. So those are the two things you can do too. And it's also always a team. I think I like making film is because you don't do it alone. And there are people like, you know, that professions which don't need a big team like painting, well, you need a curator maybe, but uh, otherwise I guess you could <laughs> possibly do that alone. Um, but I think film is like, you know, that's, that's make it, yeah, exactly. You definitely need a team. Each one has its own, or his or her own role. I think this, this make this film making so, I think so interesting as well. It's very complex, so I guess, as Lona also said and earlier said, find your own you know, your, your own club and who could really go with you along the line. Uh, just, it, it takes a long way <laughs> to get anywhere. Always, I would say. There is, I think, we just, last question for now, and because I think there are, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you have to, you have yeah, to go, have yeah, please do, yeah. yeah? Thank Thanks you so you much. Good luck in Alkmaar, right? Yes. Oh, 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 okay. Your yeah, last question. <laughs> subscription continuing. It's only 17 years per month, and last month you even get a free drink if you watch the movie. <laughs> so it's just too cheap to be, to be true, you know. So my question is, does this help the box office or like uh, make it worse, financially speaking? I think. I mean, yes. it's a great, it's a great system we have. I don't know if it's, if it's. I mean, currently, like, it's a very good deal for distributors actually, and for cinemas because people uh, kept their subscriptions during the, um, the pandemic. Uh, pandemic, like, like seventy, eighty percent. So they have quite a lot of money. So that's why they can <laughs> give away drinks and <laughs> and do uh, plus one uh, tickets. No, I think it's a great, it's a great card to have for art house cinema lovers and it's, uh, it's it's you know still growing in the netherlands actually because it used to be only in amsterdam but now i think it's in i don't know 20 20 cities something like this but no, i think it's a great uh, great way for people to to also to take a guess you know at uh, going to perhaps films they wouldn't go to otherwise so not just go to certain films they know they, they like but also take a guess at going to different kind of films Oh, filmmakers, they don't make any money, but... <laughs> no, I mean, I, I guess at some point, you know, like, depending on the deals filmmakers have with producers and with distributors and sales agents, but I don't know, like, I mean, I work in documentary film, so <laughs> there's no money there. But if for fiction film, I don't know. Like, no, but it doesn't, it doesn't change, like, if you report to a producer, if, if ticket is bought or ticket is from Cinefield, you report the same, right? It's not that it's... Uh, you get less from seeing the bill. Yeah, yeah. So uh, usually we do actually. So usually, like, so the system is now that we get a, like a really good ticket price. Usually you get like um, so a ticket is now 11 euro something like this in cinema. It's getting more and more expensive. But uh, like for a distributor, so 
I think the ticket from Cineville is something like seven and a half euros usually. So it's less than a normal ticket. Hmm? No, for for the, for the distributors. So so what we get from a from a yeah. Cineville ticket is less than than a regular ticket. But of course, on the other hand, people probably go more often. You know, so. That's a deal. Yeah, that's that's a deal. Yeah, but yeah. currently, but it's in it, in it, in it, it's currently it's a, it, it's it's better than that. But yeah. Okay. So I guess this is it uh, for. <laughs> What is the role that film festivals like us, uh, I mean, you have, of course, your con, your Venice, but like local uh, community festivals like us, what role does that play for you guys to help us know how we can continue? Uh, I was, um, sorry, I, I'm... So I'm I, 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 <clears throat> Oh. <laughs> yeah, my question is that uh, we're very glad you guys are here on the panel. Uh, my question is that how do festivals help you guys um, in terms of keep, well, for us it's about keeping relevant in a time when there's Netflix, there's streaming, I think also for films. Uh, why are festivals still relevant? Why should we still be here? And how that connects with uh, uh, you guys making films? And why, what, how do festivals like us are they relevant for you? Should we still have festivals like this? We need sound bites for our funders, quick. Oh, right, yeah. No, I mean, like, like festivals are creators, right? So it's, it, people come to your festival because you have a certain um, profile, and you can attract people who otherwise probably wouldn't go to see some films. So it's really about you know getting to know new films again and new kind of ideas from films. At least when I go to, to festivals, you know, I mean, I, when I go to foreign festivals or festivals here, it's really about getting to to know new stuff, and you know, and when you have good curators, like good programmers, like they pick out stuff that, that you know, otherwise, like someone like me or like broader audiences would never be able to see. And from a distributor, you know, so for me, like when I release a film, for example, Cinemasia now with Myanmar Diaries is great because we can attract you know people interested in Asian cinema who otherwise maybe wouldn't even know about Myanmar Diaries playing in the in the cinema. Mm -hmm. So for us, this is great to to, to reaching a new audience. Um, to get to know this kind of film, mm -hmm. similar as to movies that matter, where it also screens, it also has a certain kind of audiences, which is maybe different or a little overlapping with cinemasia. I don't know, but you know, so festivals are really good curators, and for us as a distributor to find new uh, audiences for our films, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, no. but what makes us relevant still, and, and what is our role to help each other? I think if you answered that. Mm -hmm. I did answer that or? Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with this, I think uh, we close this uh, panel. Can I react to the question? Uh, <laughs> what's that? I think we are running yeah. super out of time. <laughs> we, we can talk over drinks. <laughs> <laughs>